Hi, folks. Have a good day today. Let me the first welcome you to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Now, before we get a mess up, I'm not a psychiatrist. If you're starting to be diagnosed with autism, please see a physician. I'll just give you some of my experiences. As we're on the right to the intro and natural, they are found on freemindy.com. I also have a mission statement interview with all of you. The mission of Autism Rocks and Rolls is to take the stigma off of autism and other conditions that may think are disabilities. People on the spectrum are not broken and do not need to be fixed. Those have conditions or beliefs want to be pitied. There's nothing to be sorry about. I also have some people I'd like to thank. I must thank my earlier guests, Margie Williamson and Danny Blumens, for listeners C244 giving my wings to Margie Williamson and Danny Bloom. But what sweet and influential ladies. Thank you both so much. Everyone, be sure to check out our ARAR's new spinoff podcast hosted by my mother at C105. Meet my mother for more information. But this podcast is called Nobody Lives a Life Where Every Day is Okay. And you can find it on Podme. You will not be sorry if you choose to check it out. I have received some new Cutthroat Kitchen fan mail. The chefs include Chef Mick Brown, Chef Michael Midgley, Chef Chris O, the Rebel Chef Terry French, and Chef Chris Gentile. Thank you all for responding. And since the last episode, I have appeared on the Right From The Couch podcast with Jared Hits Swain. What a great podcast, everyone. Now, folks, we'll be right back in here and add it from the barn on Maryland Ridge. So let's get to it. There's a hidden gem in Eastern Green County, folks. Fowler's Pumpkin Patch in the barn on Maryland Ridge Running Barn. Autism Rocks and Rolls is very proud to tell you about our friends Perry and Renee Fowler and their place of business. Both Fowler Pumpkin Patch and the Barn on Maryland Ridge is a relaxing drive approximately 15 minutes from the heart of Bloomington, Indiana, and an hour south of Indianapolis. You can find them at 5347 South Green County Line Road, Bloomington, Indiana, 47403. The property has numerous pictures locations between several rolling fields, antique tractors, random rustic barns, trees, and much more. Customized wedding packages are offered on their website. The surrounding area also provides several hotels in which to have your guests stay for your destination wedding. Also, Fowler Pumpkin Patch is a family-owned and operated seasonal pumpkin patch. It's the perfect place to take your family for some fall fun. Enjoy picking up pumpkins, hay ride, a corn maze, and a petting zoo. Call the Fowler today at 812-327-485 or 812-325-6022. All right, folks, we're back. And yes, you'll definitely hear the words I do at this wedding barn. I have a fellow Hoosier and autism advocate, Adrian Nassim, as a star of my show. Adrian Nassim is originally from Floyd County, Indiana. She was diagnosed with mild cerebral palsy at birth and a learning disability at age five and an autism spectrum disorder at age 20. She currently lives in Bloomington, Indiana and works part-time at the Indiana Institute on Disability and Community on IU Bloomington's campus. There she gives lectures to college students on autism and learning disabilities on children, teens, and young adults. Adria also writes for the monthly newsletter of Indiana Resource Center for Autism, a division of the IIDC, and contributes a column to Blue Magazine dedicated to autism and developmental disabilities. A bonus fact about her is that she has a service dog, Thomas or Mr. T, a yellow lab from the Indiana Cane Assistant Network trained to assist with cerebral palsy and autism. Let's welcome my fascinating friend to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Adria, how are we doing, my friend? Doing pretty well. How are you? I am not too bad. So my first question to you is what does having autism mean to you? Um, I guess you could say, first off, I was raised by my mom was a pediatrician in Southern Indiana um, in New Albany was her main practice. And then she has a satellite practice in Salem, uh, just retired last August after 36 years. So I, uh, and now my sister's a dermatologist uh, in Indianapolis. My brother-in-law, her husband, Eric, is an interventional radiologist. So I tend to look uh, at a lot of uh, medical, I guess, medical conditions, disabilities from a very, yeah, medical, to repeat myself, um, perspective, because I've lived around doctors a lot. Um but I guess, so I, I yeah, I, I look at the DSM-5 definition now and how it's expanded to include kids that may not have the verbal delay and the expressive language delay, um, but the social and emotional um, developmental delays, which was me, which formerly may have been characterized as Asperger's syndrome. Um, but to me, autism, yeah, affects how I interact socially. It affects um, my emotional um, developmental level. And uh, I had to learn a lot of social skills and how to interact with people 
in my young adult years. Um, it affects like my sensory perception. Um, when I was little, I didn't like, and I still don't like a lot of loud noise, but my mom would tell you that if like our security system went off on accident in our house, I would immediately run outside and start crying. And like, if we had a fire drill at school, I always had to have like a buddy to help me get out of the building. Cause I would, it would just really overwhelm me. Um, I never liked like tags in my shirts. I would always be dancing when it was school clothes shopping season. I always be would, would be dancing in the fitting room <laughs> to try and itch them. Um, I am very routine driven and like a lot of uh, consistency as many children and young adults with autism tend to. I've learned to embrace like change in schedule and work with it and flexibility, but that had to be taught to me. So I suppose that's a little bit of it. Yeah. Well, what's frustrating is these skills can be taken for granted and the fact that our disability is hidden. Yeah. Yeah. I've had some experience with that. Like when I'm out with the dog, uh, Mr. T um, I've had like some people, Many people, especially around the Bloomington area, know what the ICANN program is because there is actually a student organization on IU campus called ICANN at IU that helps to train the younger dogs and puppies in training and do a lot of the public exposure um, with the puppies and dogs before they go through graduation and they're paired up with their client where they might take them to Chipotle for lunch. They might take them to Target. They might take them and sit them in an IU lecture hall so they know how to be quiet and sit on their little mat and while the kid is in class, you know, and they're not sniffing the floor. They're not up wandering. They're just sitting on their mat and they chew their little Nyla bone while they're in class or whatever. So they get used to public settings before they are paired up with their client. Um, but so, yeah, a lot of times in the, Bloomington and South Central Indiana, Indiana area, if you see a dog walking around in an ICANN vest, people know, at least around here, um, don't, don't touch it, don't go up and talk to it. But still, I have had um, some people come up and, like, I'll be walking him around and they say, I say, I'm sorry, the dog can't uh, visit right now. It's a, it's a service dog and he's working. And they'll stop me and they say, oh, my goodness, I didn't even see the vest. Whereas, like, uh, I have uh, had experience um, with clients that have significant physical disability that are, you know, use wheelchairs and they may be out with their dogs. And people just see the dogs and they know. And, you know, that stuff because I think and it's my experience that I think because the disability for them tends to be more visible uh, people just automatically tend to let the dog be, walk by. They're usually very quiet. Um, whereas with me, it's, oh my gosh, like it, it, it does have a vest on. Yeah. And the fact that it has a vest on says it right there. Even if it doesn't say service dog, leave it alone. Yeah. And, and the I can dogs. Yeah. It, it does say it says, uh, I can as the abbreviation and then it says Indiana Canine Assistant Network and it says service dog working. But yeah, you're exactly right. Exactly. So now I'm curious, what were your initial thoughts when you learned that you had autism? I have to be honest, it was a relief to me. I remember, as I said in my bio, I was 20, um, which was, I had just finished my freshman year of college it was that summer. Uh, so it was 2006. I'm dating myself now. <laughs> and uh, my mother uh, had taken me to a very good friend of hers who she also attended medical school with, um, who was a developmental pediatrician in, had a, and has a practice in Louisville. And this uh, particular provider was the one to initially diagnose me with a learning disability when I was five. And she had a colleague of hers who is a child and adolescent psychologist um, do an assessment on me, the, um, a clinical um, psychological assessment, basically. Um, and it assesses like 
both their verbal IQ as well as their functional problem solving. Um, uh, I think like in some ways it verbal falls under literacy, but functional problem solving and daily skills and such that you would need on a psychological assessment. But after he rendered the results, it went to her and she had to dictate it and she had to write it out. And then she she called my parents and we had a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And I remember first she pulled my parents in the room privately and then they came in and they pulled me in. And I remember her distinctly saying, yes, I, I think she fits what was then the pro diagnostic profile for what was Asperger's syndrome. And I remember feeling honestly like, oh good like you would have thought maybe some kids and I don't mean kids like five-year-old but you know what I mean would have been frustrated or like wow I have this I have this new diagnosis like why me but honestly I felt a very big sense of relief that now there was a reason as to why that I was working as hard as I could in school I was always very diligent I applied myself very well. Um, the kids liked me in school. Um, and I was always seen as very friendly, very helpful. But I was never one to have a close group of friends. Um, I didn't tend to understand how to um, mix and mingle around the other kids and make friends and keep them well and so now we had an actual reason and what I would see as a very good reason because it's medical I mean you can't take it away um reason as to why I was doing very good in the classroom but outside of the classroom the world was just a big confusing bubble and I think had we not had this assessment and evaluation done Sam and had I not heard the words out of her mouth of yes I think she fits the profile for what was then Asperger's syndrome and what is now level one autism you would have probably seen had you known me back then and known me well a very significant amount of continued psychological downturn um self-loathing um doubt a lot of self-negativity and yes I was at this point in my life if this is if I may share some personal information um in clinical counseling and psychological counseling for anxiety and depression um and I honestly think at that time that I I did benefit a lot from it um but I think had this not been addressed, I would have just continued to spiral. Um, and I'm very thankful that we did um, get this diagnosis. Oh, yeah, I agree, because I think that the way I was told was through a book. But after I was told, I'm with you, my life made more sense. And honestly, though, it didn't matter. I was just like, OK, this is why I get the stairs. This is why I get the bullying ordeal. Yes. And we just need to teach these people who are on the spectrum. It's just a diagnosis. That's it. Yeah. And I think, honestly, one of the hardest things many times for teens and young adults um, is to learn or to cross that bridge, shall we say, of self-acceptance and acceptance of their diagnosis, whether it be autism, whether it be um learning disability whether it be some kind of medical diagnosis especially when you look if i may say in my experience with young people who who um are straddling the world of developmental disability but have higher levels of social awareness higher levels of um intellectual awareness and higher cognition those are the young people at least in my experience and I can only speak from my experience who tend to straddle the world of I don't want to be different I don't like who I am why am I this way um and at least that's what it was for me and it took me if I may be so frank 
until I was probably mid twenties, 25 with private clinical psychotherapy um, consistently with a child and adolescent psychiatrist, or excuse me, psychotherapist that had background in serving children and teens. And well, and, and then later on when I was in this age group, young adults with autism and or developmental disability to really understand that, yes, this is the way I am. I cannot change who I am, but life is going to be okay. In fact, life can be good. Life can be good. There's some great stuff about life. We got great bands in America. That's one thing we can say it's good. And we got tasty food. And we got pretty cool creatures on here, like service dogs. Yeah. T's a good boy. I can imagine. I'm going to we'll get more to him later. But I want to know, how do you think our brains operate? Or a brain that has autism in it. For a brain that has autism, you know, I think, well, first of all, if I can preface this part of the discussion, I think what fascinated me, um, because I, as you said, in my bio, I go around and I talk to um, college kids and uh, sometimes businesses and speak at conferences about um, working with young people with autism. And I think what drew me to studying autism initially well was first that I wanted to find out who how my brain worked but just overall the broad the broadness of the scope of the entire autism spectrum the fact that you could have me sitting on one end of the room who has um you know as a child as I said did not like loud noises had to learn to hug my own parents. And instead of, you know, if I was crying because I something bad had happened, I wouldn't go over and ask mommy and daddy for a hug. I'd be sitting in the corner rocking. But also little me who at eight years old could sing, you know, songs in Spanish after hearing the song three times. Um, but then you can have, and, you know, then I went on and got a four-year college degree. I performed very well academically, but socially the world did not make sense to me. And I had to have direct instruction by a licensed clinical social worker with background in uh, working with teens and young adults with autism on how to make eye contact with people, how to have a reciprocal conversation with my own mother when I was 23 years old, um, how to, um, you know, read gestures body language other nonverbal communication um you know just things that i think peers that come into iu learn naturally as children i had to be taught and many young people with autism that's how they learn about the world is through one-on-one -on -one instruction um but what is autism feel like to me I think that is a very individualized question because as I said you can have some you can have young people that for example may go to post-secondary education may work part or full time you can have other young people that do clinically qualify for an autism diagnosis that need anywhere from 12 to 24 hour monitoring that may have um some what you call self-stimulatory or stimming behaviors the rocking clapping spinning in a circle humming to self-soothe in an environment that's too overstimulating to calm themselves um they in in the case of more significant autism you can have minimal to no uh, spoken language uh, but in that case you can look at um, other means of communication like American Sign Language, alternative communication devices like an iPad, um, a tablet, a uh, pictorial icon card, something like that. Um, it, it just, it honestly depends, I would venture to say, on the individual and their own experience. 
Um, there are some days, and usually, yeah, I, I don't mind having autism. In fact, I, I very much value using my own experience to teach incoming professionals and to talk to parents about potentially helping their children. I mean, that's what drew me to this field. Um, and I'd like to take this just a minute to just thank you uh, and your team for what you guys do, because I think the more experiences we have, the better off the world will be. Um, but yeah, I think it, it really depends. It's, it's, it's an individual experience and it's a family experience that is, is as diverse and as unique as you know, every, what are we up to now? One in 36 children. <laughs> yeah. Frank, it'll be one in 27, but you make a valid point. Numbers are numbers, first of all, but second, you said that it's individualized. You're right. We all perceive our labels differently. Some people don't like it because it's brought them down so much that they want it out of their brains. Yeah. Now, what advice would you give to someone who just learned they had autism? Well, I would almost say it depends on if it's a parent or provider, or it depends on if it's a individual themselves. Um, if it is a parent or provider, I would say um, start you know, build a, build a support community around you, um, talk to other parents who have children or young people uh, similar to your child's age and experience and get, talk about what worked for them, what did not. The earlier you can access services, the better. And you have to think that services and supports, although it is possible to have a negative experience with a certain provider or, you know, a certain type of um, intervention, shall we say, the bulk of services and supports and the bulk of professionals in the autism field, they are there to help you. They are there to try their best to enhance your child's quality of life. And even if you don't think that they're helping you, it's for your better because sometimes what they do is not seeming like it's help, but it is. That is the ultimate goal. Yes. Yes. Um, to increase your child's uh, independence level, um, quality of life, uh, community integration level, whatever it be. Sometimes it may not be a hundred percent A plus experience, but that is the ultimate goal. Yes. Exactly. So can you remind me how'd you hear about my show? If I remember correctly, I read an article in the Herald Times when I was with the Herald Times uh initially for five years because I started my column. Uh, about autism and developmental disability. And I was with the Herald Times for five years before. Uh, I've been with Bloom now for about, it'll be almost a year now uh, I've been with Bloom. Um, but I saw an article about a young adult in Greene County starts a podcast about autism. And I thought, oh my God, like this is cool. And so I I looked at the bio or the, you know, the headline and I thought, who took this story? And it was, I can't remember who exactly did it, but I looked up her email and then it showed her phone number on the news desk. And I called this particular young lady and I said, Do you have contact information for this gentleman, uh, Sam Mitchell? And she gave it to me. She shot me her email. And so I emailed you. I said, I work with the Herald Times. I write a column about autism. I just want to, you know, say, you know, what you're doing is really awesome. Thank you so much. And if I remember correctly, next time, a couple times later, maybe next time, you had me on the show and I started talking about what I was doing. Yeah, I know. I think this is the first time having the show, but I remember speaking with you. I remember that. Yeah, and we had done like a class presentation for a uh, Dr. Murray, who is who at the time was teaching in the medical school at IU. She doesn't anymore, but she was. Yeah, she I, she's pretty awesome, isn't she? 
Mm-hmm. Also, how was working for the Herald Times? Was that fun? It was fun, yes. I think it was a very good experience. Um, I have to say, I uh, made some choices. Nothing, uh, nothing negative. I just made some choices and went in a different direction. Um, but yeah, it was a great experience, and I'm I'm very thankful to have had uh, that experience. I'm thankful that you did. So now I want to talk to you more about your cerebral palsy and learning disabilities. So what resources do you use for your cerebral palsy? You know, cerebral palsy in me, I've never known life without it. And cerebral palsy, I should say, it's, well, it's not similar to autism. It's different because it's a physical disability. But it's it's similar in the way that it's not like you can wake up one day and all of a sudden say, oh my goodness, I have cerebral palsy now. Um, or in the same vein that a kid or adult can wake up one Tuesday morning and say, oh my goodness, I have autism now, unless one day they up and decide to, you know, they've been wondering about themselves and they up and decide to go to a clinical, um, you know, an educational psychologist and or a neurologist somebody in that vein and schedule an evaluation and decide and it all of a sudden is rendered that they are diagnosed with adult autism that's different but no you just you don't suddenly in the same vein as autism you don't suddenly wake up one morning and quote develop cerebral palsy um or autism but um yeah i've had it since i was about since i was born um apparently my mom the nurses and the doctors came in and told her your child is diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And they knew that I would be diagnosed with some sort of developmental disability. They didn't know what or to what degree, because I was born very, very early. I'm not sure that I said this initially, but I was born three months premature and I weighed a pound 15 ounces, <laughs> um, which caused the, and the, my brain, like, went without oxygen for x number of minutes i don't know how much but uh so that's probably what caused it um yeah I, I applaud you for remembering the when you were born in the hospital uh, or how tall you were and the pounds you were i don't remember that i guess i was pretty short because i'm a short person so well the only reason i remember is because a lot of times i give presentations to little kids too and uh, my mom has pictures and she tells me that for reference to little kids, think of like open your hand the way you would cup water underneath underneath a sink and imagine that on the tip of your head, or excuse me, on the tip of your hands is the baby's head and on the palm of your hand is the baby's body and dangling off your wrist if you cup your hands are the baby's feet. And that's the way my parents held me. Now, mind you, they didn't hold me until June 17th. And I was born March 30th of 1986. So as soon as I was born, essentially, I was whisked off to the neonatal intensive care unit because I was so sick. And so my mom, this is extraneous background information, but my mom every day, she was in her residency when I was born to be a, a pediatrician. But she says, because she couldn't hold me until three months later so every day she would come to the NICU and there was a hole in the little incubator and she would put her finger to that hole and she would touch my finger wow I bet that was a special moment for your mom I suppose and then she finally finally got to hold me but I I wasn't like it wasn't like you hold a baby to your chest I was in her little hands and my gotcha. grandmother had to sew my baby clothes because all the uh, baby clothes in the stores were way too big. <laughs> now, that's pretty great. I love grandmas. Grandmas are the best, aren't they? They're pretty good. Yep. Now, when did your parents start seeing that you had a learning disability, too? The only thing I'm aware of was that I was diagnosed at five. Um, and it is a specific type of learning disability. There's there's multiple types of learning disability. Can I just take a guess real quickly and say, is it dyscalculia? Uh, well, that is t that is one type. Yes, I have multiple, but that is one type. But this, the overall specific type that I have is called nonverbal learning disability. 
And people sometimes get confused when I use this term because I think it has to do with the individual's ability to communicate verbally and it doesn't. And they will say, wow, for someone nonverbal, you communicate very well. And I have to turn around and say, well, actually, it actually has to do with things that are not verbally based. So the verbal ability in kids with nonverbal learning disability tends to be very high. Um, it is things that are not derived from verbal skills or not primarily relying on verbal skills like math. Um, can you find your way around an environment? Can you tie your shoelaces with typical laces? No. And can you match them to where they cross over right and you don't trip on them? Not really. Can you read, uh, tell what time it is on a clock that isn't digital? Not really. Um, can you even like, if you think of going through the checkout lane at Target and matching the debit card um, through the debit card reader with the picture? Mm, not really. Not well. Oh, don't so worry about like that. I still fumble at the cash register. That'll be three seventy-five. Uh, well, shoot. Let me count out three. Let me count three seventy-five cents. Sorry, guys. I'm holding up the line. Really am not. Yeah, things like that. Yeah, I totally get that, man. I am awful. I bet I've gotten a lot of uh people mad at me when I'm at the cashier. I'm just like, can someone just else pay for it? <laughs> yeah. I really hope that sometimes. So you also worked for the, or you did work for the Indiana Institute on Disability and Community. So how did you get to work for the Indiana Institute on Disability and Community? Well, I guess it was maybe 2017. Um, I got a call from Susie Rennie, um, who was then the CEO of an organization here in Bloomington called Life Designs that does support services for adults and some children, but mainly adults with uh, developmental disabilities all over South Central Indiana. And I was at the time a client uh, with them. And she called and she said, uh, are you interested in another part-time job? Because I had then, I was then hired at the, at the Herald Times already. And I said, well, what do you got? And she said, I just got off the phone with Derek Nord, who Derek Nord is the overall director of the entire Institute. And um, she said, I, I asked who is he and you know, what does he do? And she said they're they're looking to hire an individual with history of developmental disability to do policy and advocacy work. Um, and well, and Derek called me, meaning Susie, asking, do we have any clients um, at Life Designs that are looking for work that would fit that bill? And I mentioned your name. Um and so a couple, I guess it was a couple of days later, I went down there and I sat for an interview and I met with Derek and his team. I, I liked him a lot. And eventually, uh, yeah, I, I was hired. Well, you did. I'll tell you this. three. I saw two projects. I want to get more into because that's probably what made the difference. So why don't you first tell us about Adria's notebook and what that is? Adrian's notebook, actually, I don't do that anymore, but I did for a while, uh, actually for a number of years. I wrote a blog for the Institute on um, promoting independent living and community involvement and engagement in teens and young adults with developmental disability. It is still available if you go to blog.iu.edu slash Adrian's notebook. You can read all about it. Um so they put me on that, um, and I would write at least once a month uh, from, I think, shortly after the time I was hired, I started. Um, well, that's, first of all, cool. And <laughs> if you had a pick, what was your favorite blog you wrote? 
You know, this really doesn't have to do with developmental disability as a whole, but I remember it's more specific to me. And a lot of times it was written from personal experience. Um, Hold on. Let me go let Thomas in before he fries on the deck. Sorry. Um. Sorry. Um, I remember that Mr. T's birthday or Thomas, uh, his birthday is in June, the dog. So one time for our June entry, we did a a blog post on happy birthday to Thomas. And we listed like random questions that people ask all all the time about Thomas. Like, does he what are his favorite toys to play with? Um, what is his favorite jackpot treat? Um, what I don't know, random things like what what is his favorite skill to do? Um, where is his favorite place in Bloomington that he's ever been? Well, granted, I've only been matched with him for two years, but still, just random stuff like that. And we took funny pictures of him, and one of them we got from one of the puppy raisers that helped raise him that I can, and it was him in a birthday hat. Well, I bet he looked adorable in that, didn't he? Because he's a lab. Yeah. Well, speaking of Thomas, we sell, let's save it. Let's talk about him now. Why not? So what does Mr. T help you with? Mr. T or Thomas, which was the name that I can gave him. Uh, He is a service dog that was trained through I can and he helps with for the autism he helps with crossing streets safely um you tell him a specific cue and i'm supposed to cross first because he can't be learning to pull me and learning that he rules the world and decides to go before me but yeah as long as i go and tell him when to go he he will go and he crosses the road with me um because another thing that happens when i was born is the area of the brain that was affected is the area that controls visual spatial uh reasoning so um for me to understand how fast a car is going how far away it is um how much time i have before the car hits potentially that is very very risky so to be able to have a dog um and hold a dog leash and say, okay, puppy, go, is a lot safer to walk with a dog than just say, okay, Adrian, go. And then, especially in downtown Bloomington, where I'm from, like, those, and God bless IU and the fact that it's here, but I'm not just blaming the college kids, but yes, people pull out, people cut like crazy. <laughs> um, he also helps with social interaction um, and social skills building for the autism. Um, people all around town, they see me with them and they're like, oh, how's Mr. T? What are you working on? He's a very good social icebreaker. People like to see him like perform his skills. Um, he's great. He also helps with balance and stability. Uh, when walking and on stairs for the cerebral palsy he can uh, pick up objects he can retrieve things and bring them to me Um, he can I don't make him do this but yes he can like shut the refrigerator (laughs) Um, he can like shut a door he can you know like the wheelchair accessible door buttons he can push those Primarily, a lot of ICANN's clientele that receive mobility assistance dogs are clients in wheelchairs or clients with extremely limited mobility. So, yeah, they teach things that uh, potentially a wheelchair user would need. But sometimes just for kicks, just because he likes it, I'll let him open the door with the button and he thinks it's the greatest thing. (laughs) I bet he is in awe. So, Mr. T, I find fascinating with two things. When we did that speaking engagement, you said he likes rugs. When did Thomas start liking rugs? Oh, did I? I think I did, didn't I? Um, yeah. Actually, 
yes, he likes rugs. You know, I think he started honestly liking rugs when he was probably in training as a puppy because that is a behavior that the I can handlers um instilled in him. Um, you know, they I have rugs uh in my house too, but <clears throat> pardon me. They told us um when we were in team training and when we were receiving the dogs, we had to go through like a um like a week long, I guess you could call it training camp to learn how to work the particular dogs um that we were matched with and like all their cues and how do you get them to ignore this that and the other and what do you do if they do this all this stuff on how to handle the dogs but one thing they told us is they were there were specific dogs in his class that some of them are fine on like like for example if you take them to a restaurant some of them are fine like just sitting on the floor next to the table or under the table some of them like Mr. T can have little ants in their pants sometimes and like to get up and say oh what's this oh let's go see this or oh let's try and go um visit and he won't it's just you know he so they said they told us to bring like a towel bring a mat bring something that he can lay on i don't care if it's a yoga mat bring um a blankie something that it tells to him it signals to him this is your spot I don't care if you scratch. I don't care if you look around. I don't care if you lay down. Just stay on that not, spot. <laughs> stay on your spot until I cue you. You can get off it. What's the cue for him to get off of it? Mm, either S-T-A-N-D or O-F-F. Either or. Gotcha. So I also heard about Mr. T. There was a command you also did at the place when we spoke together, it was leave it. I heard leave it. I was wondering what that meant. I don't know what that would have been for at that particular instance, but leave it to the ICANN dogs. To Lou, my my former service dog's name was Lucy. And you may have met Lucy. I don't know. Lucy was a um, yellow lab. She's now... 13 almost 14 and in retirement she's actually sitting here with thomas on the floor right now i have her for about the month because my parents are moving to indianapolis um but she's now retired but lucy knew leave it as just generally ignore said object um or thing the eye can dogs like thomas know the word leave it or the phrase leave it as leave alone something that is dangerous and will hurt you Like, for example, if you are handing out Halloween candy on Halloween night and you spill Hershey Kisses on the concrete, yes, that is leave it. If you are taking meds or giving meds to some little kid that you're watching and you spill Advil, that is leave it. If you come into contact with, I don't know, if you're house cleaning and you happen to spill like Clorox bleach cleaner all over the floor, that's what that is. Um... Yeah, something that he absolutely should not have. But I do remember maybe it was because that room we were in, we were in the medical school, just for some background at IU. And that room smelled like formaldehyde because they had been, apparently Dr. Murray said they had been doing something with cadavers or something. And he was very, I remember he was very triggered by the smells. And so at some point, yes, I may have said, listen, sir. Gotcha. You were, you were trying to make sure that he didn't go into the smell or something like that. Yeah. And well, formaldehyde is a preservative chemical and I'm thinking, okay. And I knew he would be stimulated in that room. I mean, formaldehyde to a dog is absolutely interesting. But potentially it's a chemical. It can be dangerous. So that may have been why. I don't know. Yeah, dogs are very interesting. It's interesting that we can eat chocolate and they can't. But we can have we can have rotten meat, but they can have rotten meat. It's comical. Yes, sir. So you also do lectures. So is giving lectures therapeutic for you? If so, how? I don't know if I would say therapeutic, but it's definitely... 
it's very enjoyable to me. Um, I love to talk to the students about my personal experience, but also, I mean, you know, give them some clinical knowledge, prepare them for potentially what they can see in the future. Um, I make it as fun and as, as engaging as I can. Um, I'm getting ready to do one here in a few weeks about sensory processing issues in kids with autism. And I pretty much say at the start of each lecture, you guys can ask me whatever you like. I don't bite. I mean, I would prefer it be topical to the lecture, but if you'd like me to give you my opinion of, you know, my favorite musical artist, my favorite food, I mean, I suppose, unless your professor cares, I will. <laughs> Um, well, who is your favorite musical artist? Now we're getting into it. I like the Beatles. I like Ed Sheeran. I like oh goodness Maroon Five. I like Taylor Swift. I'll be honest. I tried to get tickets in Indianapolis, couldn't get them. But you know, <laughs> you tried, and you tried at least, right? You can at least say that. We yes, I did try. Exactly. So your lectures. What is the one message that you hope people receive from your lectures? You know, honestly, this is kind of like the question about autism and what is autism like? It's it's very it varies based on the topic of the lecture. Uh, it it usually, should I say, has something to do with some aspect of autism, but you know, the professor will contact me and say X and Y we're doing a unit on autism, can you come talk to my students and I will but if they just want to do um an overview of autism and children and me share some history of my life as a child I will um if they want me to talk about transition and issues facing young adults I sure can but that's going to be very different you see I mean talking about issues facing a three-year-old with autism is quite different than talking about issues facing a 25-year-old. Right. And you also work... Oh, you also started writing for the Indiana Resource Center for Autism. So when did you start writing a newsletter for the Indiana Resource Center for Autism? You know, that was shortly after I left the H the Herald Times, which is the city paper up here in Bloomington. If you're listening and you're not in Bloomington, I keep forgetting. Um, I do that too sometimes, but continue. Um, so that was shortly after I left the Herald Times. I, um, Kathy Pratt, who was then the director of the Indiana Resource Center for Autism, we since have a new um, director, Dr. Rebecca Martinez, but she, Kathy Pratt, initially approached me and said would you be interested in coming to write for our newsletter and I said sure so that must have been I don't even know maybe two years ago maybe yeah well that is cool I'm glad you got to start writing for them I I'm glad you got to share a lot of probably ex exceptional knowledge for them I bet you made an impact thank you now, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear an ad from the Doug Flutie Jr. Autism Foundation. So let's get to it. At the Doug Flutie Autism Foundation, Massachusetts, people are receiving hope. The organization was established in 1998 by Doug Flutie, a former quarterback for Boston College and the NFL, and his wife, Lori, in the memory of their son, Dougie, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. The goal of the Flutie Foundation is to improve the quality of life for those with autism and their families. The biggest action they like to do is give grants and host their annual Stars on the Spectrum golf event. Our goal is to offer chances for physical and social activity outside of work or school, a path for education or employment during the day, and the resources need to always feel safe, supported, and informed, the Doug Judy, the Doug Flutie Jr. Foundation says. Make sure to visit them on their website, www.flutiefoundation.org, or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or even YouTube to see all the stars they have to offer. Finally, this was my testimony. It would be my testimony for the Doug Jr. Flutie Autism Foundation. All right, folks, we're back, and you might meet Doug Flutie there. You never know. So, Adri, you also got involved with Bloom Magazine. So tell us how you got involved with Bloom Magazine. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I got involved with Bloom Magazine, and 
again, if you're outside Bloomington, Indiana, you may not be familiar with Bloom, but it is a local magazine that is published quarterly here in the Bloomington, Indiana area by editor and publisher Ma- Malcolm Abrams. Um, they basically, it's a lifestyle magazine essentially that covers life in Bloomington, events, um, community figures, happenings in Bloomington, um, all that sort of stuff. Malcolm uh, is a quite well-known figure in the Bloomington area. Um, He would follow my column in the Herald Times and we would see each other around town Initially, and I, I should say, this is this is backstory, but I feel that I should probably say, I initially interviewed a long time ago, probably in 2010, maybe, um, to take an interview, take uh, in take an internship position with Blue Magazine, um, and I did not, I didn't accept it. And I don't entirely know that it was extended to me. I think they it, they went with someone else, but it was fine with me because it wouldn't have been at the it wouldn't have been what I was looking for. It was it was more to the lines of you know putting things in envelopes, cleaning you know um, the office, making sure everything was laid out the way it should be stamping envelopes so i think they got someone else but Ma- that's what put malcolm put my my face and my name on malcolm's radar that was in maybe 2010 and at the time i was in a and in 2010 i was finishing up support services at a private independent living skills and post-secondary program for college students with um shall we say, verbal uh, autism and learning disability here in Bloomington. They have, it's called the College Internship Program. They have multiple centers across America, but um, the Bloomington Center is the only one in the Midwest. So I was finishing up uh, services and support through them, and I was looking at an internship with Blue Magazine. But that uh, initial interview and contact with Malcolm was what put him on our radar, and so Years later, you know, I started writing for the Indiana Daily Student. Uh, but years later, I I finished my time with um, the IU student paper, the Indiana Daily Student. I got a job, an actual position, if you can call it a, a big girl position, I suppose you could say, with the city paper, the um, Herald Times here in Bloomington and in I came and when I was hired by former editor of the paper of the Herald Times, Bob Zaltzberg, he asked me, Adria, if uh, you would be interested in coming to write for us, what would you write about? And I told him, I think I would be very interested in doing a column dedicated to developmental disability and autism. And so Malcolm who also subscribed to the paper uh, would see my column uh, every couple of weeks. And he said, I like your column. I think you're doing a wonderful job. Um, not to toot my own horn, but uh, so he would keep an eye on it and even read it. When I left the Herald Times, he came to me and he sent me an email and he said, would you be interested in coming to Bloom Magazine? Um, and I said, you know, my initial reaction was, oh my goodness, like I thought this chapter was over for me, but I I was very pleased and I said, yes, um, thank you very much. And I accepted. So, so in now, a sense, yeah. you did time traveling almost. I did. <laughs> What well, sounds like to me, at least. But even though we're smiling, we had to get into something that really did kind of bother me. And I apologize that you went through this, and that was going through bullying. And I went through bullying, too. So how can we help others who are getting bullied for being different and see that we're not the problem? 
Um, I think this part of it goes back to creating that young person, whether it be with autism, with um, learning disability, whatever the diagnosis be, creating that young person a safety net of who are your people you can go to that will stand up for you, will love you for you, and will look out for you. And that goes to peer, that goes for peers, the same age peers, as well as school staff, um, people on school grounds that are supposed to be, that are the adult figures, shall we say, that are um, the administration, the coaches, the lunchroom staff, um, that are the advocates for the kids. And the I people think who some, take people under their wing. Yeah. And I think one thing, if parents and professionals are listening now, to always keep in mind is particularly, yes, keep in mind, keep um, an eye on all kids in your schools and in, in your programs, but particularly kids with developmental disability. Um, and I would absolutely venture to say to have adults, um, if you can, in places where adults usually may not be, because that's where bullying um, typically tends to happen. The locker room, the cafeteria, the playgrounds. I mean, they have playground staff, but, you know, kids go off in their little groups on, you know, on their own. Um, they find the little kids sitting on the curb playing with their phone. Hey, kid, what are you doing? You know, all that stuff. Um, so keep an eye on those kinds of areas. Um, keep an eye on kids with, with disability, not always, but sometimes with disability also comes, um, social and economic disadvantage. So keep an eye on kids who may be lower income. Um, cause that can also be a reason for, uh, kids to say, oh, I don't like you. Like you don't have the $500, uh, you know, uh, messy Jersey, whatever, you know, um, and you walk funny, um, different stuff like that. But for the kids, I would say it's hard now. But if you can find people who love you for you, despite the fact that you have cerebral palsy, despite the fact that you have autism, despite the fact that you have learning a learning disability, and say, you know what, you may have all that, but you're you're Adria, and we we really like Adria, um, and just say you you can come hang with us. That's what it's all about. And it took me, I'll, I'll reiterate and say it took me until I was maybe, you know, 21, 25, but I did find it. And, you know, your community is out there. And I encourage you to, to spread your wings, to find your little niche of people and um, just see where it goes. Because it, it does get better. It may take some time, but it does. I would agree with you there. I didn't agree with you. I wouldn't agree. Blah, 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 try that again. I agree with you, but I wouldn't have agreed with you when I was 15. I thought I was just no. no friends. I'm a piece of garbage. But let me ask you this then. So it seems like you do have a lot of good days. And I'm very thankful for that. I do too. But do you still have maybe bad days where you still think, even though it's been so long, the bullying kind of bites you in the butt where you kind of think that sometimes, not all the time, granted, but sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Like recently, I was out just taking Thomas for a walk in the neighborhood and it was, I think it was moving week for IU recently. Yeah, well, it was. And I was out taking Thomas for a walk. And... Here we go with, with the invisibility of autism and uh, learning disability to boot. <laughs> um, so a young woman and 
this person I presume to be either her boyfriend or her husband were sitting, excuse me, standing in the middle of the sidewalk, like literally the middle to the point that you almost had no passing room looking at their cell phone. Um, and then I was trying to just be as polite as I could and get T, Mr. T, um, to pass them so we could keep on walking. And the young woman, like, she thought I didn't hear. And she starts whispering to her husband and looking over at me. And she says, well, take up the whole sidewalk, why don't you? And so I, I almost thought about not saying anything. Um, but I did actually finally um, kind of just turn to her and I said, ma'am, um, I'm not trying to inconvenience you guys. I just want you to know that there's a reason why I walk in the middle of the sidewalk. And it's because I was born three months premature and I sustained quite a complicated brain injury which injured the part of the brain that um, is responsible for um, visual spatial um, functioning so uh, my body my brain does not have concept of how far away I am from something or how much space I have before I hit something or will be hit so again I'm not trying to inconvenience you that's just a fact of life and then she got very, very quiet and she said, oh, I'm sorry. And I said, it's OK, just maybe in the future you shouldn't uh, prejudge and you shouldn't try to be so insensitive. And I, I feel the debt walking. perception issue, by the way, because I don't drive for that reason. Yeah, and I just kept walking. And, you know, then she she starts screaming at me, starts yelling at me. Cost, call, excuse me, calling me like different obscenities and whatever, and I just kept walking. Yeah, you don't need to hear that, right? You got other stuff to hear that's positive. No, I was I was halfway down the sidewalk then telling T uh, that he was being a good boy for standing still. I know it, it go it worked like it just worked like that, didn't it? Yeah. So you, however, even though you dealt with bullying, you had a really cool CIP transformational experience. So why was your experience with CIP transformational? Um, It just, along with my parents, who've always been very, very supportive and were very instrumental in helping me access services very, very young. Uh, by the time I was 14 months, which I think definitely influenced my outcome. Absolutely. It it showed me um, what I, um, you know, it helped me gain the skills that I needed to be independent and to further, um, further me to the young adult life that my parents had always hoped for. Um, and... I still, I'll I'll say right now, I still require day-to-day -day support. And I'll be honest, I don't know any young adult who's on the spectrum or has a developmental disability that doesn't receive some level of day-to-day -day support. Um, but it, it really did up my confidence and up my independent living skills. And not just independent living, but like vocational skills, social skills, um, yeah, it did a lot for me, and I'm I'm very thankful. Well, here's the good news. People treat, what's frustrating actually is they treat interdependently like a bad word, and there's nothing bad with that word. Yeah, I think that, um, at least in my experience, many times parents, and again, I'm not trying to bash parents, but um, many times parents, especially parents with young people that tend to have higher cognition and higher levels of social awareness when they are approaching or have already uh, exited high school they can struggle not always but they can struggle with the idea of facing the idea of supported independent living for their kid 
Um, I think it's very difficult sometimes for parents with kids with high cognition uh, who, again, tend to perform well academically. If my kid is doing well in school or can do well in school, then he should be okay with life skills or he's going to be okay. You know, once we get him maybe a couple months of uh, clinical and psychological counseling or a couple months of ABA behavioral support, he'll be okay and he'll live on his own. He'll have a, you know, 30, 40 hours a week job. Um, and I think it can be an adjustment. And again, I have to say in, in all honesty, I want people to know I have never been a parent. I am a adult uh, child who was raised by two very involved parents and now go out and do advocacy work and uh, public speaking on developmental disability. And the only thing I can speak speak uh, from is my experience. Um, but yeah, it can be an adjustment, I think, for when, when um, young people hit the 15 to 18 to 21 year old range and they're still very, very bright for parents and for other family members to come around to the idea of supported independent living. I agree with you 100% there. Speaking of independent living, I did see something else on your um on the on the Indiana Institute on Disability and Community. You made a video about the importance of having home and community-based services. So, can you tell us why is it so important to have home and community-based services? And why it's, in your opinion, relevant? You know, now you're getting into the the big, ad, and I'm not saying that what the other stuff I do is not important, but now you're getting into the stuff that, excuse me, I've talked to lawmakers about before. Um, home and community-based services is one of the, if not the, bread and butter of helping young people with developmental disabilities and medical complexity to really be able to live and thrive to whatever their fullest potential may be in their own communities and get out and be part of the greater community. Um, and it could be, it doesn't matter the level of um, diagnostic, you know, functionality for everybody who falls under the the umbrella of developmental disability and or medical complexity, home and community-based services, that's what allows us to grow, live, and thrive and do life, quote unquote. It could be, you know, for me, I'll give I'll give you some examples from life. Home and community-based services are paid for by the Medicaid waiver. Once, to my understanding, I wish I had somebody like a behavioral therapist here or somebody that knew better than me but to my understanding once the kid uh leaves high school um it can, it is paid for and some children can qualify for the medicaid waiver too but uh once the kid reaches adulthood most of the time if they have a developmental disability uh most of the services that they rely on day to day can come from the medicaid waiver and medicaid waiver a uh, lots of budget to each, uh, shall we say, client or participant. Some of my services that fall under home and community-based, for me particularly, would be uh, clinical psychotherapy and uh, psychiatry, uh, mental health. Also, gotcha. And I love the fact that you get that because mental health matters. It does. It does. And it's, there's a very high, if we're on the subject of autism, there's a very high correlation between autism spectrum diagnosis and mental health uh, co-occurring disorder, um, whether it be anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, whatever, um, a lot of uh, comorbidity. Um Another one for me is behavioral support services. Um, I think actually applied behavioral services or applied behavioral analysis, as it's more commonly known, tends to be more for children with autism and or developmental disability. But 
I'm actually there's such thing as a behavioral condition too. And under Indiana Medicaid, this is getting very technical, but under Indiana Medicaid, it's termed behavioral management. I'm not necessarily a fan of that term, but okay. Exactly. Um, but speaking of law enforcement, you did present a while back to the Bloomington, Bloomington Police Department. I what, did. What did you hope? And what did you hope the Bloomington Police Department took from your presentation? You know, I have to say, it wasn't just me. It was me and another professor in the social work department. Her name is Kristen Hamry um, here at IU. And we together, we did it. Uh, and so Kristen talked, or Dr. Hamry talked about some reasons um, that the, a police department might receive calls about autism, some some of the clinical hallmarks of autism, um, how to facilitate potentially a successful action, interaction, pardon me, with a um, city resident or visitor that has autism, some things you can do. I talked about my experience living in Bloomington with autism and or, and I have to say, I've never had any interaction with law enforcement at all um but i know some young people with with autism can um but i just had to hypothetically say uh give it my best guess and i just was very honest and i said i can imagine that for adrian to seem to be approached by the police and say put your hands up and like you know like run and uh you know and if you don't and i gave the example of many times if you don't follow directions what do they do they run faster they yell louder they may um pull a taser out um pull pepper spray in some cases pull a gun and i gave the example of what do young people and adults with autism sometimes not like is loud noise and oh my word, I can only, I said in my personal appearance, I can only imagine. Oh, this is my it, favorite. Freeze, get on the ground. Here's my yeah. question though. How are you supposed to freeze and get on the ground at the same time? Do you freeze and then fall on the floor? I don't get that. It, well, and there's an example of some young people with autism may take that literally. And what do I do first? And then they start to panic. That, that would be me. I'd be like, uh, how do I do this? Do I freeze and then do I fall? Do yeah. I literally freeze in the refrigerator? No, and, and we talked about the use of literal language. So if you say freeze, what does that mean? I think like freeze, like like literally freeze. Um, and so I just gave them, for example, my my assessment of if I were ever in a in a situation that warranted call to the police, what would I feel like? I would probably run which would then escalate to them running and potentially yelling. Um, I, and I, I am also, and this is personal information, but I'm also diagnosed with a co-occurring anxiety disorder. So my mom and my mom, at, I said, mom, what if you were up there talking on my behalf about raising now a young adult with autism, what would you say? And she would say, I would venture to guess that Adrian and Seam would cry her eyes out and not do what they said, which would escalate more, which would involve you crying more. Um, Yeah, so I talked about the comorbidity of autism and, and anxiety um, and sometimes them not meaning to you know lack of following instructions is not to upset you it's to because they're so amped up they can't think straight yeah i i agree with you on that one but definitely so you also have a well let's try you're also on the board started as a board member for the monroe county autism foundation so what did you and other board members of the monroe county autism foundation for do to spread acceptance of autism I don't know that it's necessarily about spreading acceptance of autism. What the Monroe County Foundation, excuse me, Monroe County Autism Foundation does primarily is to fund supports and services 
um, for families um, and individuals living with autism or um, affected by autism who could not otherwise access or afford them. So for example, we have funded communication devices for individuals. We have, during COVID, we helped with food relief. We have helped with things like, um, I mean, even like for community access, we've helped with like bus passes for people to be able to get to their internships. We've helped with funding swim lessons at the Y, but it has to be that the applicant or the family lives within Monroe County, Indiana. And uh, the, I think it's either the um, individual has a diagnosis of autism or if they're a parent applying for a child, that child has some level of autism or a loved one with autism. We also helped fund, we help fund uh, what's called Camp Connections every uh, summer, uh, which is a summer camp um, that's done through Monroe County Schools that's sponsored. Well, I mean, the Monroe County Autism Foundation helps fund it, but it is, uh, it's a camp th uh, for K through sixth graders with some sort of documented communication disorder. So it could be autism, it could be intellectual disability, it could be something like, oh goodness, childhood apraxia, which I don't know if it's that is in itself its own communication disorder, but um, we're going to use it. <laughs> so if there's any speech language pathologist listening, um, you can render your own opinion on that. Um, you know, it you'll have be... to talk to someone in Bloomington. You'll have to talk. Have you talked to Adam Wheeler for the listeners? C221 celebrating the spectrum with Adam Wheeler, but he's a speech therapist at Clear Creek Elementary School. Yes, in fact, I I know Adam, um, somewhat. Yes, I do. Yeah, he's a pretty cool guy, isn't he? He's a good guy, he really is. So, I want to hear more about this view with disclosing. I thought when you mentioned it previously in an interview, I think through the church. You had talked about it. I thought it was kind of cool. And maybe it was during another interview. I can't remember exactly. So tell me more about when we should disclose and not disclose. Well, again, let me let me start off and say disclosure is a personal choice. It is a choice. Uh, disclosure of diagnosis is a choice of the individual. Um, so whether you do or don't um, is up to you. But in certain situations, my answer has always been yes. Um, like, for example, when I, I th well, that's forever long ago, but, well, let's go re more recently. Like when I was hired at the Institute, the one of the first things I did was to go to my supervisor and go to Derek, who is the head of the Institute, Dr. Derek Nord. And I wrote them, I either wrote them a letter or I just had private meetings with them in, the off, in their offices. And I just said, I want you to know that I'm diagnosed with um, cerebral palsy and a learning disability and autism. Um, and the, these are uh, some of the ways that they affect me. Um, but I just want you to know that this is part of my daily life. And, you know, thank you for being so accommodating. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to approach me. Um, and they, they've they been absolutely wonderful. And also, I did the same thing. I'm out of college now. I graduated in 2010 with a BA in English and a minor in Spanish um, uh, from Brescia University in Owensboro, Kentucky. It's a small private Catholic university. Um, but... I also did it with all my professors. They knew, um, and thereby I was given specific accommodations for like testing and use of a calculator on math test and uh, scribe for testing and um, different sorts of stuff. Some people, particularly young adults, may not want to disclose because 
they may feel that they out of disclosing disclosing may may, may be viewed differently uh, may they don't want to quote receive special treatment or you know be looked at as special um Oh, I think a lot of young people, when it comes to disclosure, those who resist may do so out of fear of judgment, fear of rejection, um, those sorts of things. I I can totally understand that um, because I think in being part of the developmental disability community, often young people with developmental disability do have experience with judgment, with ridicule. Um, but I have always chosen to, to disclose in my personal situation, just because I don't want there to ever be any doubt in someone's mind, particularly someone like a professor in college or like an employer of, and I don't, I don't want there to ever be, you know, of this kid doesn't work hard enough. This kid seems lazy to me. This kid, why can't you work any faster? It is totally beyond an individual's control. I don't care what the diagnosis is or level of level of severity that they are born or that they later require in life a disability. So I want them to just know straight out, this is the way... I work. Um, there is no laziness. There is no lack of trying. There is no, um, I'm sitting here doing this, that, and the other. This is the way I am. And if you want me to work in your department, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, but this is what, what I come with. Exactly. And, I, I just... and you have to be honest too. It gives you a sense of comfort. So I disclose too. Because in my view, when I say it, they know, oh, he said something kind of off. Okay, he's not trying to be weird on purpose. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a good that's a good strategy too, because like autism, it is it is a social uh, communication disorder. And one of the hallmark uh, areas of of difficulty is impairment with social situations and social skills so yeah for you to come forward and just say maybe to a a group of peers or maybe to a professor hey I want you to know that I'm on the autism spectrum if I say something that maybe has nothing to do with the conversation this is why people go oh okay you know instead of thinking you know did you like not take your meds this morning or what's going on like What's going on is I'm I got a medical condition. <laughs> yeah, like I mean literally nothing else to it. So you did get a lot of social support though through some sitters I've heard. So what did you learn during your social support with your sitters and others? I don't know that I would call it necessarily specialized support. I mean, it didn't come from any specific program. It didn't come from, you know, any kind of modeled curriculum, nothing. It well, was, I didn't think it was anything special. I just thought it was like just in general babysitters helped you with support. It was. It absolutely was. Um, it was, you know, that they were hired to watch us after after school and then later as we grew um take us to swim practice but for me it was that they were also working on things like reciprocal conversation life skills with homework they would help with homework but they would also work on those skills uh in the community um and i think like for example if um i don't know if we were working on uh age appropriate skills for a 13 year old yeah reciprocal conversation but how to play with other not why well, I shouldn't say play because 13 year olds I don't know that they play but how to do age appropriate things how to show interest in age appropriate things for a 13 year old and again I go back to I had to be directly taught a lot of that so we were constantly working on something um 
from the time I was a toddler all the way to I had I had sitters till I was about 16 because I didn't get a license um and then it was that I was staying home alone with my younger sister Janelle who's now 33 and a dermatologist maybe 34 she just had a birthday um but we were staying home alone uh but it was yes a few hours at a time staying home alone but up until then it was social skills and developmental skills were modeled by babysitters and taking them out into the greater community and i think that's one of the good hallmarks of a of an autism um enrichment program is that it's not just the kid can the kid do it in the clinic it's can the kid do it at lego club can the kid do it at story hour can the kid do it at you know sunday night dinner out at the restaurant with mom and dad can he do it at the soccer game on saturday afternoon with the other kids whatever Right, and I agree with you, but I think here's the deal too, Adria. Even though that they may get a yes, it's not going to be a yes 100%. I mean, they know I can do it to a point because I still, like I said earlier, say some stuff that are off. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. But that's that's part of it. I mean, and you're it's a constant work in progress. I agree with on that. I agree with you on that one. Now, folks, we right back. But make sure to stay tuned because we're going to hear a little more from Adria. It's just about her personal life a little bit. But first, we're going to hear an ad from The Rock from 96.1 radio station. So let's get to it. We want to thank 96.1 The Query, especially David Dan Hayes, for being a gold sponsor for our summer fest. 96.1 resi- resides in Bloomington, Indiana, and like autism rocks and rolls, they rock and roll too. Visit their website, HTTPS Rock961FN.com. Listen to them live on their website or catch them on the radio in your car. If you like Kiss, Queen, 80s Rock, or ZZ Top, I think you have found your station. 96.1 supports our veterans, so you should support them too. Visit 96.1 and keep rocking. Yeah! All right, folks, we're back, and you'll definitely rock out if you want to. All right, folks, we're back, and you'll definitely rock out to this station. So, Adria, I want to hear more about trivia and board game night. You did a lot of those, apparently, so why don't you tell us about that? Um, I have done them. I don't know that I do a lot of them. Um, but yeah, I like trivia. Uh, my favorite show is Jeopardy. Uh, and I like playing trivia, like at bars and stuff. Um, I'm not really, when I go to a bar and play trivia, like I'm not really there for the alcohol. I'm there to see how many questions I can get right. (laughs) Hey, who cares? You're there for a good reason. And you're putting yourself out there socially regardless because bars are hard for me too. Because just because of certain social aspects in a bar when everyone's so outgoing, but is it because they are sober or should it be just because of the alcohol in their system? I don't know. Yeah, it's always been hard for me. So you also are a reader. So what is your favorite book that you have read? Oh, good Lord. We could be here for a while. Um, It depends. Favorite book? I Oh, my. I like, I really like To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't know if it's my favorite, but I do like that book. Um, mm, And like, as far as children's books, I have this book. If anybody is familiar with Kevin Hinkies, he writes children's books. And um, if you go into the, like any public library, you should probably have his books. And I know for a fact that Monroe County Public Library has his books. Um, but he, he writes a couple of his books about these little mice. And one of them is a book called Chrysanthemum about a little mouse that like hates her name and all the kids, all the little other mice at school on her first day of school, like make fun of her. It is like one of my favorite books ever. (laughs) I gotcha. I'm not a reader at all, but have you read Lord of the Flies? I had to in school. Yes. Was it pretty good in your opinion? Oh my God. I, well, I have to say I read it because I was required to, I don't know if it was pretty good. I mean, I I don't know that I would want to be in the situation of being a kid on a deserted Island and having to get off. Oh, I wouldn't either, but I think 
even though I, I was required to, it made me want to read. If you can make me want to read in school, that says something to that with that book. Yes, indeed. So you also are a swimmer, and you mentioned it earlier. So is swimming therapy for you? If so, why is it? Now we're getting into is this therapy? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed, sir. Um, swimming. I started swimming on a swim team when I was about mm, 10. And Janelle, like I said, my younger sister was probably six. And my mom, well, my mom and dad, but especially my mom, um, was looking for a sport that the both of us could do together. Um, and there, I'll be honest, there weren't a lot of sports with physical disability, especially, yeah, and or mobility, I suppose, inter interchangeably, um, physical disability that I could do without getting hurt because back then there weren't a lot, at least in our area, we lived in Southern Indiana, about 15 minutes outside of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. There weren't a lot of programs for kids with um, high physical, and I don't have high physical needs, but you know what I mean? Like um, adapted physical uh, sports leagues for kids with physical disability. So it was that Janelle and I had to find something that we could do together. Um, and she thought about swimming. I loved water ever since I was itty bitty toddler and she put us in swim lessons. Uh, this is, it, it was always really funny because Janelle later went on to get a college scholarship for swimming and swam for Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I just swam for fitness on a team from the time I was about 10 until I graduated high school, I was 18. She, Janelle swam in college. She swam state from the time she was 11 until she was about 18, um, and zones and uh, just a bunch of stuff and was quite good. Um, but Little Adria, as soon as my mother would always tell us we could get in, was all the way down at the other end of the pool. And Janelle was, oh, it's not all the So it was funny. Um, but yeah, we grew up swimming together. Um, and is swimming therapy for me? Yes. I still swim about three times a week um, here at a local pool. And I love it. It's I tell people it's like my meditation. Like some people go to yoga. Some people, I don't know, get up at like eight o'clock and run. No, for me, it's swimming. Well, I'll tell you, I like the pool too, but I'm nitpicky on the temperature. If it's not above at a certain point, I'm not doing it because I hate the cold. Hate it, yeah, hate it, I, hate can't it. Do, I, I can't do freezing cold water either. Oh God, no. I, I'm surprised people go there. I have a friend and I'll just make fun right now. No, I better not. I'll just be nice to him this time at least. <laughs> so I can tell from the looks of you had a wonderful family. So how did your family show that help is fine? If you need, like you say before, your jacket zip, it's okay that you can ask someone to help and there's no shame in that. They started teaching me, you know, I guess you could say self-acceptance self and self-advocacy very young. Uh, they literally, I guess you could say, had that discussion with me I, I was I just know that I was very little um and they they would say things like AJ it's okay like you need some help with some things that the other kids might not um and they would tell me like you know if you need help with your socks if you need help zipping your jacket if you need help um I don't know what it would would have been like writing your name on your paper just go ask somebody and they'll help you and so I got used to very young just starting to ask people uh for help with stuff and it stuck I mean not every little thing but obviously different stuff yeah gotcha so we'll wrap it up here and these are just for fun so what is your paradise meal or favorite food and why is it your favorite oh my goodness 
paradise meal or favorite food? Uh, probably Mexican, to be honest. And I don't know that I have a specific dish. Just I'm absolutely crazy about Mexican. Um, I have about six bottles of hot sauce in my fridge at any one time. Um, yeah. Well, you get along with my grandmother very well. For listeners, see 121 meat Tay Tay, but she loves Mexican. Her favorite's fajitas. I will eat pretty much any Mexican. Yeah. So what's been your favorite vacation you have ever taken? And why'd you enjoy that vacation very much? You know, we as a family have not really had a chance to take a family vacation for a long time now, just because everybody's been so busy. Oh, goodness. I, well, if this counts, I went to Kings Island with some good friends last summer, and that was fun. That 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 does count. Have you been to Cedar Point? It has roller coasters, I, and it's pretty bigger. <laughs> I have not been, but I've wanted to go. Adria, go. I'm telling you, you have some homework to do. I know I'm not your teacher or anything. Like I know I'm not your teacher, but you got homework. Go to Cedar Point. Okay, I'll try. All righty. This is my final question. Are there any good memories that you want to tell our viewers about? If you do, why do you remember that memory the most? But before you answer, I like it to end with something sentimental that just made you feel good inside and forgot about the world can be a cruel place and a funny memory that made you fall on the floor laughing. It could be with Thomas, be with your family. Your call, you want to answer it, buddy. A good memory that made me sentimental. Good Lord. Um... Probably, well, this is somewhat recent, but probably on the day that I got to meet Thomas and that uh, we scheduled like the meet and greet and I got to go up to the ICANN offices uh, in, in, in Zionsville and they told me they brought him in and they said, this is your dog. And I was, oh my gosh, I was just, I stared at him and I remember I said, hi, buddy. And I didn't really say much at first because it hit me that the seriousness of this relationship and the seriousness of the responsibility that I was about to take into my hands. I think a lot of people see service dogs and they see them lay on the floor in a restaurant and they don't move a lot. They see them walk down the, down the street and they're really focused. They're really calm and they think, well, that's not hard. And it's not, I guess you could say hard if you if you have experience, but for me, it was the fact that I am now responsible not only to a living being, but also to an organization to uphold their policies and to take care of him for the better part of his life. And oh my gosh, it, it was the coolest thing in the world. Was that the first time you felt like a true adult? No, the first time I felt like a true adult was when I did it when I had to do it for 10 years with Lucy, who was not trained by a national organization, she was privately trained, but that's what really primed me for now my second dog, Thomas. But, uh, and I just remember I was so excited. Um, and I thought, oh my goodness, like this is going to be so much fun because that's what it was with Lucy. It was the biggest responsibility that I've ever had in my life, but it was the greatest thing I've ever done. Is raising a dog sometimes like a child? Uh, people that, especially a service dog, it is, it is, it is very similar. Yes. Yes. Just thought I asked that. Well, Adri, I think that's all. Is there any closing remarks you'd like to say before we head out of here? I think I just like to say, thank you for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Um, thank you for reaching out to me. It was great. Well, thank you, Adri. You're going to definitely help out.